Welcome to another very special edition of Life Talk. I am your host, Sherry Ann, and we talk about the things that matter most on this program. And today, I have joined forces with not only a good friend, but also my personal family physician, Dr. Toby Taylor. He is certified in internal medicine and pediatrics. And what many of you may not know is that I also am a doctor, but my specialty is in chiropractic. And we thought it would be very important to show a holistic doctor and a medicinal doctor coming together for one common goal. And that is to talk about defeating or beating or taking precautions for COVID-19. One of the easiest ways you can do that is a simple face mask. But we know that there's a lot of controversy about this, and so we want to try to discuss some of your questions today in an open and honest way and hope to come together to show you that there are steps that we can take to fight this very real disease. Now, Dr. Toby serves on a lot of health boards, and he's been to an awful lot of meetings about this, I'm sure. And he has a lot to say about this. He even has a channel that he on YouTube called Dr. Toby, and he's been making a weekly series mm -hmm. on the COVID-19 progression or regression, what's happening with it. And he also put up one about masks recently, and I happened to notice that got the most views of all your videos. So this is a hot topic, if you will. And before you be, we begin, I want to read something to you because what you also don't know about Dr. Toby and myself, or may not know, is we are both very faith-filled Christians and believers. And we still believe it's not a conflict of our faith to attack this problem medically and with precaution. I want to read something to you if I could. It says, make sure you test positive for faith, you keep your distance from doubt, and isolate yourself from fear. Trust in God through it all. And we both do this. And with that, I want to open up the floor to Dr. Taylor, a faith-filled family physician, to discuss our frontline approach to COVID-19. We cannot do that. First of all, welcome and thank you for being sure. here. You're welcome. We absolutely cannot tackle this without answering the, the, the most pressing question. But the flu kills so many more people, so why are we even talking about COVID-19? Do you think you could explain why this is such a big deal? Okay. So the flu is seasonal. It does come around every year. Um, it does cause a very big disease burden. They're, the mm -hmm. hospitals do fill up in the, in the winter time. We get really busy in the winter time. But even with the, with the flu, let, let me just compare numbers right now. So for the first three months of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States, um, there were about 120,000 deaths in the United States. Okay. And that happened in a really a very short period three months but really the when it was hitting is more like two months so in two months we had about 120,000 deaths okay. a lot more hospitalizations than that obviously compare that to most flu seasons flu seasons for an entire season which can last six months mm -hmm. the average number of deaths in, a, in one season is anywhere from 20,000 to at the most about 60,000 okay so we're talking about a third to a quarter as many deaths in six months versus two months those are just numbers. Those are re very real numbers, but it tells you that COVID has brought about more death, more illness in a shorter amount of time um, to the tune of, you know, four times as much. Um, but that was in a short period of time. So maybe it's like 10 times as much. So when you much multiply worse. that out. Yeah, it's much worse, right. When, when you look at COVID illnesses, of all the people that, have, uh, that get a COVID illness, about 15% will end up in the hospital. 15%. 15 15%. Right. 15% will end up in the hospital. And that's been pretty universal across all countries. So the disease burden for the hospital is very big. Okay. Um, at this point, um, we've only had a small fraction of our population who's been infected with this. Mm -hmm. With antibody tests, it's probably around 5% of the nation has been infected with uh, COVID-19 up to this point. So only a small number. But look how many people have been hospitalized. Look okay. how many people have died. Um, if we were to allow this virus to spread broader, you just have to multiply those numbers. We would be full of the hospitals. Across like, the country. Right, across the country. So New York City was, and, and Italy were the big warning signs to us, mm -hmm. uh, to the rest of us. And really, when Italy filled up their hospitals and went beyond their capacity, um, it was a big wake-up call for us. That was kind of the point that the United States started to react. 
and then it reacted a little, maybe too slow for New York City, but New York City is a hub of activity across the world. So, and it's very condensed and mm -hmm. it's very tight. So mm -hmm. New York City, if you go back in the news back in March and April, they were beyond their capacity. They brought this ship in, and the ship didn't fill up. They That's brought, right. They only brought about 150 of those beds, or those thousand beds that were on the naval ship. But they were beyond their capacity. And so it's a good, New York City is a good example of what it could have been if we didn't take precautions. And those precautions being masks and social distancing, right? right. So could That's you talk a little bit about, yeah. now this is the, you know, a little homemade cloth mask that I have, and we are keeping a very good distance. Normally I sit a little closer to my mom, uh, but certainly we want to keep social distance with non-family members that we're not living with. And so I have this little cloth mask that I wear everywhere. Um, is it effective? Is it working? Okay. So a couple things you got to know about these. Um, face coverings are there to stop particles. They're not there to stop your air. Um, they're all made to where air can tra go through the mask very freely. Okay. Um, so it, it shouldn't decrease the amount of volume that you can breathe in and breathe out. Now some people feel claustrophobic when they're in a mask or if they're doing something high intensity they may have a little restriction in their airflow. But really you can get enough airflow to support you. So masks allow plenty of flow back and forth. So you're saying you're not getting decreased oxygen not, because that's a common not, argument not. on social media. So this mask here is not a barrier to molecules of oxygen or CO2. Okay. So if, if you took an oxygen level here and an oxygen level here, no matter where you are, they're the same. Oxygen will diffuse across this membrane easily. It's, there's no, there's no, stop, no stopping. The same thing with CO2. So, um, the carbon only, dioxide, yeah. CO2, carbon dioxide. <laughs> <laughs> the only exception would be someone who doesn't have a lot of respiratory capacity. Somebody with severe emphysema, putting something like this on them might make it difficult for them to pull enough air back and forth. But somebody who's got even people with asthma, uh, as long as you're not in an acute asthma attack, okay. you can still pull enough air back and forth across this mask. It doesn't restrict it that much. All right. And and hospital doctors wear these all day long, right? Right, right. Yeah, right. I mean, it's a I bigger I, age old. These have been worn for years. Right. I think that point's been made a few times on social media of doctors coming on and saying, look, I, I'm a surgeon, I wear this for hours at a time, and, right. and my oxygen levels aren't dropping. And, and that's right, it's true. And we understand there's always exceptions of people who have bona fide conditions right. where, like you just mentioned, emphysema. Mm -hmm. So maybe a face shield, perhaps. Well, for them, they just need to stay away from people because they're already, at, they're already at high risk because of their lung disease. And yes, right. for, for some people with advanced emphysema, this would cause some problems with pulling enough air. Um, it would make them feel claustrophobic. It would okay. make them feel bad. Um, so it would be difficult. They could still wear it in public for short periods of time. So what does it mainly do? Um, th so the other main contention with this is, and people are right, that these don't filter down to the size of the virus. So the virus may be as small as 100 nanometers. It's somewhere between 80 to 150 nanometers in okay. the coronavirus. And rightly so, they'll know that this kind of a surgical mask, uh, depending upon the type of mask, its filtering capacity is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 nanometers. Okay. So it really doesn't filter down to the size of a virus. Okay, why is it still effective? Because viruses don't really just float in the air, it's just a virus. When they come from our mouth and nose, they come as a droplet. Okay. And so it's coming as a droplet of saliva or mucus, and that's much bigger. You okay. can see these things a lot of times. So if it's blocking the droplets, that, that blocks the vast majority of the virus. So there is a debate. Can they be aer aerosolized? So aerosolized means that the virus is floating in the air by itself. Okay. It's not floating anything else. It's just a viral particle. It's possible. There are probably some virus that can float, okay. but not many. It's mostly in droplets. And so the mask now, if you have the mask on and I'm speaking to you, it can will it block my droplet coming towards you. Right. And likewise, right. it won't let your droplet come out towards me. Right. So this is keeping my droplets close to my mouth so it's not extended. So when I'm talking um, in a normal voice, um, I can extend my breath 
probably out to about here or so. Okay. Um, and any droplets that might come from my mouth might come to here and they might drop down. Um, but they're not going to project all across the room. If I sneeze or cough, I can project my droplets six feet or so mm -hmm. uh, with a sneeze or cough. So um, that's a real danger, right? And that's, that's where social distancing, that's where social social distancing, distancing comes right. into place Sorry. as well. Because but if you, if you wear this mask, yeah. you, you do keep your own droplets right here. They're right in front of you. So they're not being projected into the air. So basically, if I get this correctly, the virus itself is so small that it could go through, the virus itself can go through the mask? If it were just a virus in the air, but viruses don't just come out by themselves, they're in respiratory droplets. And that's where the masks are helpful at blocking. Res right. Respiratory droplets are large. Even a cloth mask like this. Can block a respiratory droplet. So Respiratory okay. droplets are just what you see. If you've ever seen a video of somebody with a sneeze, yeah. Everybody seen that? You, you have that slow motion video, you see the droplets go out. That's what we're talking about. This cloth is enough to block those droplets. Uh, surgical mask is very good for drop, blocking those droplets. So social distancing helps, but not enough, right? We need right. them both. We right. need the mask need and social distancing. You should have them both. Um, when um, the, the mask especially when you're moving about and walking by people and around people, right. it keeps your droplets to yourself. People say, oh, I go to the store and I stay six feet. Well, what if somebody bumps into you? What if you sneeze? What if you get an allergen going down the uh, detergent aisle, which happens to me all the time, right? You can't control some of these involuntary things that may happen. That's, that's exactly right. So, so these do help that. And the, the other thing, and, and you may have heard this on social media and other places before, this is trying to help somebody else. Um, if there is a, a droplet that's in the air and somebody did sneeze and it got on my mask, there's a small possibility to get through. But if you wear a mask, you're protecting me. If I'm wearing a mask, I'm protecting you. So the key is it's keeping the droplets. And we, we specifically kept our distance and took our mask off because I'm, as you know, hearing impaired. And I wanted my audience, a lot of you who also have difficulty hearing, we wanted you to see our mouths and to hear. So we pulled our chairs apart. But he came in with the mask. I've been wearing my mask. But keep in mind, it keeps your droplets right here. And so it's a kindness. It's a kindness that we're extending. It's a, you know, kind of being our own keeper and our brother's keeper all at one time, right? Uh, it's really not that big of a deal. It's just a kindness that we extend to try to get through this together. Because like you said, if we don't start slowing the spread, it will multiply beyond the capacity that we can handle, right? Mm -hmm. But then the next argument becomes this. The numbers are overreported. The numbers are underreported. What are the numbers? Is okay. this as big as we think it is? Can you comment to that sure. at all? Yeah. I, I don't see any agenda in the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did a lot of research on this in the past week. When you, uh, th those of you that are really following this online, probably go to the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, tracker site, and it gives you all the numbers. Probably you guys have seen the dashboard. They do their own numbers. This is an academic institution. They're not government run. These are ac academics. They, they are not swayed by politics as much as a lot of other people. So they're like almost mathematicians. They're just numbers people. Yeah, people. I Data also people. went to, right. There's another uh, organization called the COVID-19 uh, Tracking Project. Okay. That is staffed with a lot of volunteers. I went through it and I looked at it. I looked at the blog. I looked at the people actually volunteering. They're mainly graduate students, academics, and in, in different science degrees, and they're real people that have no agenda that want to see good science. Okay. And they want to see good numbers. So there are more, and so the CDC is also tracking the numbers. Uh, how does the CDC get their numbers? Well, they get it from each state. Okay. They report it. How does the CDC get it? They get it from each county. How does the county get it? Well, they're counting the hospital numbers. Um, they're counting their test numbers. They're counting the reporting, and they're giving it. So, does somebody have an agenda to inflate these numbers? Mm -hmm. How are you going to control every county health department okay. and get them to over-report these? I don't think you can. I think there's a lot of honest people working, and I don't know how you would make people inflate numbers. Now, 
Go yeah. Ahead. Well, I was going to say one of the ways that they're the saying people do that is somebody comes into the hospital for a broken femur. While they're there, they get tested and they have COVID. So now they're now listed as a COVID hospitalization. That's what people are saying. Yeah. So um, the COVID tracker project looked at that exact question. And actually, there's a different, different question, the deaths. Yeah. So one, one is how do you count COVID deaths? Mm -hmm. Is it, so one of the ways it's done mostly is by the death certificate. Mm -hmm. So when somebody dies, and that's a very black and white way to count it, but it's also a very slow way, and it's also dependent upon the doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm, I fill out death certificates all, um, wow. all the time when my patients die. It depends upon what I put down as the cause of death. So there's some variability there. But generally, that's not a bad way. But you have to wait at least a week or so to get those counted. So another way that, that, that some uh, organizations will do it is by case death okay. or, or in case death. So it is what you just said. If someone has COVID and they die, they, they would count it as a death for COVID. Now, will that over-report? Yes, a little bit. So they looked at that in the states. There are some states that will report their case associated deaths and their um, death certificate numbers. Okay. It wasn't a big difference. It was okay. a very small percentage. Not all counties, are, not all states are doing it that way. So that's what people are looking at. They'll see those examples and say, oh, they're doing it by case. Some states are, not many are. Yes, it does over-report by just a hair, um, but it also gives you better, quicker numbers. So there's plus and minuses. So the st statisticians that are looking at this, they understand the, the nuances between the ways of reporting it. I think when the press gets a hold of it and people get a hold of it, they say, oh, look at this. Yeah, there's a difference. They're, they're reporting people that just died with a diagnosis, but they didn't really die of it. We know that. It's not a big number. And it's also a better, quicker number. So both of these are going on right now. And so I don't think it's over-reporting. So it's not statistically significant, I believe, is how they say no, that. Right. I'll give one more. So. Uh, I believe this was from, from JAMA. They looked at excess deaths over the last three months. JAMA is the Journal of American Medical Association. Medical Association. Right. So it's a peer-reviewed journal that's very well respected and not one person is doing it. Lots of people look at it. So they looked at the excess deaths in the United States uh, of the, the three months from March through uh, March, April, May. Okay. The excess deaths from what you would think there would be from those years and previous years was 122,000. So during that time period, it was 781,000 deaths. You would expect during that time period about 660 deaths. Um, so just looking at the excess deaths, mm -hmm. if you just didn't even look at COVID numbers, 120,000 people died um, more than the average. It was in a excess. lot of, yeah, in excess. And what was the only difference? It was COVID. COVID. So it's another uh -huh. way to kind of double check. Is there really that many people dying? Yeah, and those were just death certificate numbers. They were pretty black and white. Um, those two sites where people can track the virus again, what did you write, John Hopkins? Yeah, John Hopkins and um, the, uh, co the COVID project, the COVID, the COVID tracking project. project. Um, you can also go to CDC. They do their own tracking. So my point in saying that was CDC tracks it, but through the health departments, the COVID tracking is doing their independent tracking. Okay. Johns Hopkins is doing their independent tracking. They're not the only ones. These are not government, I mean, CDC is government run. Yeah. Okay, but they have scientists that, that are supposed to be uh, independent and are supposed to do their own thing. And have worked through all the different administrations right. for years. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so I think there's people double checking this. And I think there's enough reliable sources out there that you're not getting a grossly um, uh, inflated number. There are some inherent inconsistencies, yes. It's almost like voting. Um, you're going to have some, all the numbers are not going to line up perfectly. You're going to have some ballots that weren't co counted correctly, or you go back and count it again, or you miss some. It's not going to be an exact number, you know, because you have so many people reporting and so much tabulation going on, right. but, it's, but it's reconcilable. It's not so significant that it accounts for uh, false, dating, false data, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Is right. that the, and so we just talked about death. So let's talk about life. What a treatment.